my name is Alyssa Gariola. I am currently a teacher's assistant for LSAT Unplugged. I'm also a consultant, which gives me the uh, incredible pleasure and honor of being able to interview those that are established in the admissions realm. So please, everyone, I want to welcome Michelle Mason, who's here with me, and I'm going to give you a chance to tell you a little bit about her. Uh, she's such an impressive woman, and we're really happy to have her here tonight. So Michelle Mason is a Senior Associate Dean for Experiential Learning and the Associate Dean for Enrollment at the Florida International University College of Law in Miami, Florida. Senior Associate Dean Mason joined FIU Law as Founding Associate Dean for Admissions and Student Services in 2001. Prior to joining FIU Law, Mason worked as Phillips Exeter Academy at Phillips Exeter Academy, Seton Hall Law School, and Vermont Law. In 2010, Mason was appointed director for the FIU Law Center for Professionalism and Ethics. In 2014, Mason changed administrative roles and was appointed as senior associate dean for experiential learning. Mason has taught in the FIU Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs and currently has been designated as a faculty fellow for the FIU Honors College. In 2016, the Department of Humanities, Health and Society at the Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine provided Mason with a secondary appointment as faculty administrator. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here this evening. I'm so happy. I'm just going to jump in. And if anybody's listening at the top of this, maybe podcast or YouTube video, we're going to talk a little bit about the admissions process, uh, a little bit of Michelle's background, uh, about the LSAT, and kind of hopefully touch base on a little bit of those things, and maybe even what life is like at FIU. So Michelle, just off the bat of background about yourself, can you give us a little bit of an idea of what led you into admissions? Wow, I'm going to be as brief as possible because we only have an hour. And, and as much as lawyers love talking about themselves, I'm sure you want to know about other things other than, than my background. So I actually, I grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey. And as I joke with you, you can expect to hear the Jersey accent come out more the, the later the evening becomes. Um, right. I'm a first generation student. Neither of my parents graduated from high school. Um, and interestingly enough, I, I think the difference for me is that my mom has always emphasized from the time that I was very young education, and more importantly, she had emphasized that she wanted me to go to law school, and so I was a good kid, and I said, okay, mom said go to law school, and so there was a lot of decision making that, that led to that, but I did in fact start law school in 1992, and went to Rutgers Law School, went to Rutgers undergrad and law school. Um, did a whole bunch of things in law school that all the things that law students are, are told that good law students do. And I would say 98% of them weren't for me. And by the wow. time that exactly by the time that I graduated from law school, I said, I, I don't want to practice law. And so I had student loans like all of you or many of you will have when you graduate from law school. And so I said, I got to get a job. And so I started thinking about you know, what made sense for me, what, what parts of law school did I enjoy? And so I had been very active in the student organizations. I had volunteered for admissions office. So I said, okay, does it make sense for me to try and find a position doing admissions work? And so I actually ended up going to all the way up to Exeter, New Hampshire, where I think the uh, population is about 20,000 people um, okay. and became an admissions uh, professional there, worked there for a number of years went to a nonprofit in New York, wasn't the right fit. And I can answer some questions about fit and finding the right job if people have those concerns. And then again, I had to figure out, okay, I had to, to get a job. And that's when I went to Seton Hall and I got into law school admissions. And then that's where I found my calling and, and have been so excited and happy about the opportunities that I have had over you know the course of my time. I've, it's, it's interestingly enough, I've been at... Um, FIU law for 20 years. And it was funny because I didn't even want to apply for the job. And here I sit 20 years later. And yes, I'm only I'm only 27. So I was a <laughs> of course. But really? no, it was one of the, the best decisions that I made. And 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 I can't for me personally, I can't think of being any other place working professionally other than FIU law. You know what? I want to say thank you right off the bat because you're touching on 
things that as I, I work with LSAT Unplugged, and so I sort of see people that are applying for law school a lot every single day. And what you've just mentioned in terms of your past, you're touching on these, like in my imagination, like kind of like hot seat buttons that are, is sort of like the talk of the year, or I think, in mm -hmm. terms of what I believe is sort of happening. There's one thing that you're touching on, which is student loan debt. And, and, uh, and there's another thing that you've touched on right now in terms of what to do with your law degree. And I'm a, I'm a underrepresented minority myself. I'm a Hispanic and female and queer. And because of that, I come across a lot of URMs who uh, are concerned. They are trying, they are first generation. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking to a lot of people that are first generation. I'm speaking to people that are uh, trying to build something for themselves in their life. Similar to the story that you told about your mother and, and, and her education, like right. we're thinking. And what's what the conversations that I find are happening are wanting to build something, a better life for themselves, having these core values, right? Even if it's maybe we can get into this later, like maybe advocating for human rights. I see here in your CV that uh, you were appointed co-chair of the FIU fostering uh, Panther Pride Committee organized to launch program providing fo former foster care and homeless students with additional support to assist them during their college years. So you're walking the talk, you're talking the talk and walking the walk. I can see right here, but I think that you're going to be a really important person to hear from because uh, I can't, I can't get past it. There's a lot of things on the internet right now that are scary. People are saying that they're leaving law school with debt and no jobs or, and of course people, everyone knows that people are gonna go to the internet with polarizing ideas, but I'm really excited to be sitting here with you today because I think you're gonna have a lot to offer in terms of a lot of the conversations that I've been having or been in the room with. Well, let me, let me say this. This is, this is going to be a bit more I'll be candid. I, this will be a bit more exciting than I anticipated. I thought it was going to be the rock. Well, let me tell you about FIU, which we can talk about FIU law, but I have a passion sure. about this, right? So one of the things, and I believe that it's not just a matter of, like you said, talking the talk or walking. And so one of the things that I was able to do after, you know, I, working at FIU for a number of, of years, I would say one of the things that I, I, I say to my students that I teach at both the undergraduate and law school levels, I say to them, and it's kind of hard to think about this at your age, but what do you want your legacy to be, right? The reality is that I think if we look historically at, at, at the United States, if we look globally at what one person has been able to accomplish, I think, and certainly for those who are interested in going to law school, I think there's a part of you, irrespective of whether you decide to become a corporate attorney or focus on social justice issues or do public service, whatever you decide, I think there's always a part of you that wants to give back to your community in some way, right? And so I think each of you has to identify that and say, what do I want my legacy to be? When I leave this planet, right? When I leave this planet, how do I want to be remembered, right? Do you want to be remembered as the great corporate attorney? That's fine. If you've done that and you've you know, negotiated wonderful deals, that's great. That's an important thing. A lot of money comes from that. Nothing wrong with money. Money pays for stuff, right? We get that, right? But it's also, are there other things that you can do? And I think lawyers, and I fundamentally believe this, are uniquely situated to look at your community, to look at the country, to look at the globe and say, how do I make the world better, right? And so me in my small way, one of the things that I decided to do, and this is something that I'm doing on pro bono voluntary basis, back in 2019, I wrote a grant essentially to create a program to support first generation underrepresented students and to say, okay, if you wanna to go to law school, this is what you need to do, right? I was able to get this grant, grant through Access Lex, which is an educational organization. Um, and what we've been able to do is that I actually got our faculty to agree to teach in our program. So in that first summer, our students do all of the um, foundational courses. The second summer they come back and they um, get a free LSAT prep course because the LSAT is one of the most important parts of the application and I can talk to you about that. And so you've got to get, and if you, either you pay for an LSAT course, you save up for an LSAT preparation course, or there are so many programs nationally where that's a part of their curriculum, including FIU's, uh, our FIU Law Path program. But you've got to take some prep. You've got to take some prep, right? So we've been running for that program since uh, 2019. I have 67 students who are participating in the program. I have two years of students who are first year and second year students. We have about 
17 students who are currently in law school. Of those students, I believe, I don't wanna overstate the numbers, but a, a number of them receive scholarships, right? Because law school is expensive. If you want, if you're, and, and you have to understand what you're getting yourself into, and you have to know as, I mean, you have to decide, I think big picture, whether you wanna do public or private sector. As it stands now, for the most part, private sector pays more. And so you have to understand that, okay, if you wanna do public interest work, or if you wanna work at a smaller firm or mid-sized firm, then you have to leverage yourself as much as possible on that LSAT. And so I'll, I can keep talking, but I'm sure you have other questions, but I have such a passion for this. I'm sorry. I just I actually, it's, uh, it, This is going to be a really fun night because I, I really want you to keep talking. And then I'm thinking, well, okay, she said that I want to touch base on that. But, you know, you talking about you talking about how expensive law school is something that I don't know if the, in 2008, there was, a, there was a dip in the economy, and my generation's parents, per se, were mainly affected by that. And with this current global pandemic that's affected so many, I, I hope everyone's being safe right now and, and feeling healthy, is that right now we are on the cusp. I think a lot of the conversations are or is the same thing going to happen You know, with that 2008, where a lot of people were exiting, the, entering a law school. When when economy when the economy has a dip or maybe there's some uncertainty, a lot of people go to higher education. A lot of people are going to apply to law school. And so what you're saying right now, you are actually talking about a lot of opportunities that I've, I speak to people every day that feel isolated and they don't know that the, there are LSAT prep courses. They don't know that there is there are people like you and I can hear it in your voice that are passionate and, and are like, let's go, let's go, let's do this. And we're going to help get you there. So that's something that's actually really impressive about FIU. I actually didn't know that at all. So I hope everyone caught, caught that, that you mentioned that. I wanted to ask you something though about the LSAT. So let's just go right into it. Okay. The LSAT score is important. How do you, how does FIU, how do you, you can answer it. Uh, some people like to kind of speak in terms of the whole school, the, the, overall mindset about it. I've been hearing different things. How do you view multiple scores, for example? Multiple scores, we we being the, uh, the admissions committee of which I'm one of the members, we take the highest score, right? So that's something that you look at. I caution students, and it's interesting because I had a conversation with one of our, we the, the students who participate in our program, they're referred to as FIU Law Scholars. So I had a conversation with one of our scholars earlier today and I said to that person, you don't really psychologically, and, 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 and I understand there's a generational difference and it's also just emotional difference, right? I would not take the LSAT until I was ready and knew I had done everything I needed to do because coming out on the other side and not having the score that I anticipated, that has a psychological, would have a psychological impact for me. So that, that's me, right? There are other students who look at it and say, you know what, I want to take a shot at it. Let me just try this once. Let me see. And then I, I can look and see where I am. I have some kind of, I guess, floor, and then I can work above that, right? So one exactly. of the things that I think is so important, so while FIU says that we will look at the high, we see both scores, right? But we look, we will, quote unquote, take the highest score in terms of looking at it and saying, okay, if you perform, wherever you perform your best, that's the one we're going to use as a part of our decision-making process. But every school is different. So you've got to check individually and contact those schools and see how they um, look at those scores. The other thing is that people are individuals, right? And so if you have a huge, like if there's a huge gap between the scores, some people may say, well, what does that mean? Is that, does that mean that you're going to be inconsistent when you're in law school, right? So you, got, you have to think about all of these things, right? So as I said, for our, our purposes, we look at it and we say, okay, what is the, the highest score? Uh, you know what, it's it's really interesting that you talk about the psychological and emotional difference. Maybe it's generational, but what I'm really hearing you is just maybe knowing yourself, knowing yourself and having that grip. And if, if anyone's listening to that podcast, Michelle's nodding her head. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a podcast. I'm nodding my head. <laughs> <It's lovely. laughs> I'll just narrate you. I'm happy to, but you know, knowing yourself, knowing what your end goals are and and also being able to get a grip on it get a grip on it and get a score. I have kind of a funky question for you and it's mm -hmm. really specific okay. because this conversation just happened yesterday. One of my favorite things is to pull in what people are actually saying in, in right. rooms when we're all studying together. Uh, one person brought up, you know, I heard that if you have 
if you're if you take the LSAT once and your score is right at that median of what that school is in those ABA disclosures and your score is right at that medium, let's say your GPA is right at that median and let's say you feel confident in the rest of your materials, I'm talking holistically, the application, mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and assume everyone listening to this knows that the application as a whole, the personal statement, which we'll get to hopefully, everything counts, everything is creating this bigger portrait of the applicant. So what I'm asking is if those scores are right on the median, does taking it again, especially with as competitive as the cycles are, show more initiative? And could it potentially, if say two people have similar applications, if one person has taken it once and looks like, okay, one and done, another person has taken it twice, bumped it up just a few points, does that kind of push forward that that you look like you're dedicated, you look like you have shown initiative, you look like you're a little bit more passionate and committed to the program. Would that push your application over the fence? Here's, here's what I would say. My take on it is if you're at the median, and, and I'm gonna caution you because 2020 has been different than 2019 in terms of enrollment and 2021 is going to be different, it looks like, right? So traditionally, you could look at the previous year's median and say, I think our previous year's median was um, a 158, right? That was for 2020, the entering class. And so if you're at, let's say, the 158, and I think our GPA was a median of about a 3.61, 3.62, if you're at the median, generally speaking, median means you're going to be admitted and you may qualify for, or you probably will qualify for scholarship, right? But what you have to realize is that it's not just you as an individual, it's, a, it's you in comparison to the rest of the application pool, right? So if you have folks that are coming in and applications are up and then their LSAT and GPAs are up, that in fact may move the median LSAT, right? So that's something that you have to look at as well and say, okay, I'm there now. So if you're at the meeting, what, I mean, I, I, Here's what I would say. If you're at the meeting for that school, it probably makes sense to apply earlier than later, right? I, just from a strategic standpoint, let's just be strategic, right? Um, but take if you do make the decision to take the LSAT again, I don't know. For me, it's not so much, I wouldn't think it's like, if you're at the meeting then nine times out of 10, unless there's some character and fitness issues, you're going to be admitted to the law school, right? If you're talking okay. about scholarship, that might be different. Folks at the median may only get a half scholarship or three quarters of a scholarship. And if you're above the median, you may get a full scholarship. So students may sometimes make the decision and say, listen, if I can push up my LSAT a bit more, um, and, and, and depending upon where you are in terms of undergrad, you may be able to push up your GPA as well between the fall and the spring semesters, then yes, it makes sense for me to do that and, and, and leverage that. Have, again, I'm going to qualify it because everything is depends in law school, right? So the way that the LSAT, in order for the LSAT to have any kind of validity, right? They, they structure the examination that when they give you your score, they give you the score and then they give you a band, right? So you have to be very realistic. And that band is saying on any given day, you will either be a few points below where you are in the, where you scored or a few points above, right? So you have to be candid and honest with yourself and say, do I really think I can go above the band? Because what happens if you drop, right? Mm -hmm. And if schools are taking a different approach, you may, you know, the school may say, you know what, we're going to average those scores. It concerns us. We're going to put you on hold. So be very careful before you make that, exam that, that decision to take the ex examination again, because you want to push it up. Not to say you can't, not to say I haven't seen it because I have seen that happen, but those are all the things you should consider before you do that. I'm going to pass this interview along to somebody else I was just speaking to who uh, what is also first generation, right? There's a lot of URIM that are first generation. There's a lot that aren't that are first generation. There's anybody who maybe is feeling isolated that I hope that they can hear you speak on this uh, because one of the first things that we're talking about pushing a test back, pushing the, pushing the LSAT back to make sure that it's going to be a reflection of what your true potential is and, and your commitments into it and making sure it's also, I, I'm getting from you like a maturity decision, a mature decision of, of really committing to it, pushing it back. One of the first things I hear from applicants is, what do I tell all the people around me? They're going to think I'm just pushing this test back and back and back. And I think what you've just said is really validating for that sort of you know, inner thought that kind of comes up that feels like a crisis uh, to people and maybe they're even their social cir circles or communities. So here's, here's what I would say. When I graduated from law school, I went back um, 
probably a year later, and I was working at the boarding school at the time uh, for an event that they had for alumni. And I told people at that time, I wasn't practicing law, right? I wasn't even admitted to the, to the bar. I'm admitted now. We, that's another longer story. You may need to do like a, a follow-up with me. We need a part um, two. <laughs> part two. Um, and so when I said I wasn't like doing what traditionally lawyers should be doing after graduating law school and passing the bar, people looked at me like I had failed, right? You can't worry about what other people are doing. You have to figure out what you who what's going to make you happy professionally and i'm talking from a place of sincerity i i am i would have if i had practice in a traditional sense i probably would have done it i would have worked very hard on behalf of my clients but i don't know if i would have the passion and drive and love i love getting up and going to work every single day every single day and that's what I want for, no, in, in all honesty, my husband's like, you need to stop working. But I was like, yeah, yeah, I know, <laughs> a little bit, right? But, but, and I want that, and I want that for all of you. I want you to have the passion. I want you to have the blessing of feeling like you matter, that you get to use your intellect and that, you know, it all makes sense for you, right? So everybody's going to tell you what you're supposed to do. You, you know, when you are avoiding something because you're afraid, I've been afraid. I've avoided stuff. I have, right? And usually when you avoid it, it gets worse, but, and I can speak from experience, but I, you know, when you're avoiding something, right? But you also know when you're ready to tackle something. So when you're ready to tackle something, you will. You have to just, one of the things I would say though, when you are serious about it, you've got to get yourself on a schedule. You've got to write out pretty much a, a professional development plan and say for the next six months, 12 months, two years, whatever it's going to be, whatever your window is, you need to do that and you need to stick with that. You know, that is actually really incredible advice right there. I think now is a good time to tell everyone that Michelle was named as one of South Florida's top 50 most powerful black professionals. Uh, so that's she has that title under her name. Uh, so really, really great advice in terms of the six months. There has there is actually one last question about this LSAT and I'd love to move on mm -hmm. to materials. And I actually have tr mentally been trying to stop myself from going backwards, but I think that our listeners and I think that the community of LSAT Unplugged I think everyone's ears are going to perk up. And so when you mentioned, I'm taking it way back, about the LSAT prep, mm -hmm. and you mentioned that FIU has this. Is this an in the undergraduate program at FIU? Uh, no, for the so, LSAT? so essentially, I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you, I apologize. Please. So yeah, what, well, what, because I get, I'm telling you, I'm so excited, right? So what we've done is a part of our, F, it's the program is called the FIU Law Path Program. I'll send you the link and you can share that with uh, folks on, on in this meeting, if you like. And so right. that it's a part of this, the, the FIU Law Path Program is, the full title is because lawyers always gotta make things complicated and I created the title, is the FIU Law, Pract Law, Law Path to the Legal Profession, right? So we call it FIU Law Path. And so as a part of that program, which is a part of the law school, if you're admitted to that program, the, one, the first year, as I said, is foundational courses, and then there's other programming that we do during the academic year, and then in that summer, sum, that second summer, we place you into an LSAT prep uh, course, right? So that's through FIU. There is through LSAC, and I think students should take advantage of it as well. Through LSAC, there's the Khan Academy, which is a full program, um, LSAT prep program, and that's for free, right? And so one of the things you want to do is because there is a cost. I, these programs can cost it. Our program is free. And as I said, I'm so glad that we're able to offer it to our students. But any, if the program can cost anywhere from $700 to two dollars to $3,000 if you get a private tutor, right? So it's an expensive proposition. So one of the things that I did was I saved up enough money until I was able to, to be able to do the, I took actually Princeton Review back in, and we won't even say when that was because it's not relevant. But anyway, I right. took, I took right. the review. Um, but it's, nice. I, I'd say to all students that you've got to take some kind of Your audio has cut yeah, out. I, mute, I muted myself. There's some students who can use the Khan Academy materials and do that independent and study on their own and will be disciplined in that way. And we'll find that material because here, here's the other piece I would say, all of us have a different learning style, right? And I discovered this in law school. So for one course, it may, may make sense for me. Well, we had cassette tapes. Y'all don't know what cassette tapes are, but we had cassette. So for, for certain courses, I would listen to audio tapes, right? Or, or the, uh, C, CDs to learn the materials. Other courses, I created kind of flow charts. Others, it was just a matter of reading the material and 
honestly getting outlines from other students and being yeah. able to take the, the final examination, right? With the LSAT, the LSAT has different components. And so there's some materials that may make more sense for you than others, right? And so you have to break it apart just like that, right? And so that's why you need to get yourself on a plan where you're going to be studying from wait, wait, at, at a minimum three months, right? And then after that, you, you decide what makes sense. But at a minimum three months, and then you have to say, okay, for this portion, for the, the logic games, okay, I may use the Khan Academy materials. And then if I have, um, I'm taking Princeton Review or Kaplan or one of the other courses, then it makes sense. And then the last thing I will tell you, and I did this for the bar exam and is certainly true for the LSAT, you've got to take practice exams. I tell students, you all, myself included, we all get afraid and we're like, oh no, I'll just wait to the exam and I won't take it. You will not get the score that you want. You've got to study during the week. You've got to pull it apart, take little mini, mini examinations. And then on the Saturday or Sunday, you've got to set aside that time and take a, a full examination. And you keep doing that and you keep doing that until you get the scores where you want to be. And it worked for our kids. I'm going to tell you, there's a student, a scholar who's in our program. This particular student was struggling. And we had a conversation and I said, okay, listen, you know what? And this is the other thing that I think it's important. It was clear to me because I also, when I was hired at FIU Law, I was, I was appointed Dean of Students, right? So I worked a lot with the students and some of it, some of the counseling, there were students that I sent to our university for evaluation. And it turned out the students should receive certain kind of accommodations, right? And so this particular scholar, it turns out, should have been receiving uh, accommodations. This person went from essentially in the one, 30s to 160 something on the LSAT. And it rightfully so, because they they needed uh, they needed someone to advocate for them, to guide them. Uh, I come across, I come across, it's, it's so incredible when, and I've talked about this before on, on this podcast, that accommodations are put there in place to even the playing field not to that's not a boost it's not it's not the boost that's actually in spite of uh even more than that i'm sorry to interrupt you you're Please. legally entitled to those if you're if you are so let's just, we're going to be lawyers right so this is what you're legally entitled to under state and federal law good i want everyone to be listening to this and to really these lessons that you're saying is exactly what's sort of going on the merry-go-round of, of these rooms that I'm in when people are studying and you're speaking to kind of like a collective experience of uh, insecurity, of not wanting to take practice tests, of maybe pushing a test back, insecurity, or maybe a nervousness of not looking, uh, checking into accommodations. I know that I I came across people who had never even opened the accommodations tab on LSAC, on the LSAC uh, website, and it took them years to, to realize that they were legally entitled uh, to those. So I love this conversation uh, because you are speaking to a collective kind of experience that's happening with people. And when you talk about those multiple practice tests and really being ready and also getting yourself on a schedule, it's, it's definitely easier said, said than done. <laughs> Most things but, are, right? <laughs> most yeah, most things but, that require hard work are. <laughs> right. You know what? That And the last thing I'll, I would say to this is that you brought something up that I see people struggle with. And that is using different ways of learning for different things. I have been, it's really been happening a lot, Michelle, that I'm sitting with someone and maybe they have done fantastic and they're, and they're learning the analytical reasoning logic game section of the LSAT. Maybe they're transfer, they're transitioning to learning about logical reasoning. They, maybe the student or the applicant feels different or the material feels different and they're studying it in the same way. Or I like that you brought up using different materials. Maybe they're using one book or, and they think, okay, I'm just gonna use this one material and everything's gonna click for me. And what I see happen almost, almost definitely weekly is that somebody is approaching something in the same way, and then they get down on themselves and feel like they are, something is wrong with them as an individual, instead of saying, wait, I need to change this up. And that's what you brought up. And Again, I hope everyone listened to the really impressive uh, resume that Michelle has and just how fantastic you are to listen and hear that you yourself realized that it's okay to change it up. You can you learn to. things. 
different materials, different things. There's nothing wrong with you. In fact, you're, you're encouraging people to do that. So just just what I just to add, when I was um, in my first semester of law school, right? So folks, and everyone's going to have advice for you when you're in law school about this is what you should be doing, right? And so I I looked at the point of finger. I was like, well, they should know. They've come before me, right? And so one of the things that um, I did was that I worked with the study group, right? So study groups where you get a group of people together and study different study groups handle it differently. But what we did was we worked on an outline that you create to help you study for the final examination. We worked on that together. That was the worst thing for someone who learns the way that I do, right? So I get to, and, and this is why I never forget your family, right? So I get through um, the first semester of law school and I probably have, and here's the other thing, people never talk about their grades in law school. I'm going to talk to you about my grades, right? So I had somewhere between, I had, because I'll do the best one. I had an A in my legal research and writing class. So that made me feel good. And then I had B, Bs and I got, a, I think, a C in contracts. I got a C in contract. Oh, my God. Nobody gets Cs in law school. Everybody's perfect in law school if you let them tell them, right? And so yeah, I was yeah. devastated by the C, right? And so it's funny, I talked to my mom who had not graduated, who, you know, graduated from high school. And, and she said to me, figure out what you did wrong and don't do that the next semester. And I was like, okay. <laughs> she was right, right? So when I like, I swear to God, I swear, I, you know, and I hope I'm not like insulting anyone by swearing, but ultimately, and, 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 and it was so simple, but so true. So when I did that and I said, okay, let me look at the different courses and unpack this information and how can I learn it? And that's why sometimes flow charts are going to make a difference. And sometimes, you know, looking at audio, there's so much free material that's on available on YouTube. Some of it's garbage. So you've got to look through it and make sure it makes sense. But there's a lot of good material that's there. Even what, you know, your organization is offering to students just to look at that and unpack that, right? And so- sure. You have to do that. You can't, the, the, the reason why individual tutoring works is not because these, oh yes, the tutors are very smart people when you can work with them on a one-to-one -one basis. And if you can afford to do that, great. But it's because what they do is they drill down and they look at specifically what your needs are, right? And so if you can't afford a tutor, you need to be able to drill down and figure out what your needs are. You know what has gotten you through undergraduate, right? Or if you have finished, completed that graduate program. Generally speaking, law students or people looking at law school have great grades, right? So take those, those, those skills and those tools that you've used and leveraged in undergrad and figure out how you can leverage them for the LSAT and then for law school. This is incredible to hear this sort of command that your, that your mother actually, you know, encouraged you to have over yourself. It sounds like it's definitely what you're saying directly speaks to this sort of cloud, the generational cloud of, are we all going to be stuck with student loan debt and, and not, and not be able to, to be able to have a career that lines up with that amount of debt? Like what you're, this sort of command that you're having, that you're encouraging people to have over themselves, it sort of directly alleviates that, um, that sensation and all of that, because if this is exactly what you've done with your career, figure out what parts you like, follow that figure out what parts you did wrong and just don't do that again. It, it's really, uh, really beneficial advice uh, to everyone, especially when it comes to the LSAT. I don't know if this year is, is different uh, because of the pandemic. I don't know if this year is different because uh, law school applications are up, but I'm sure there's always been LSAT anxiety, but the people that I'm around all the time, it seems like they're, it's a pretty exceptional amount of anxiety. So I hope everyone can take those lessons to heart. There's a lot of anxiety because of, of what's going on around us, right? And so, and 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 as I said, I teach in the Honors College and and I and it's interesting, I teach a bioethics course, so it has a lot to do with, you know, or it's very relevant to the things that we're experiencing now. And so you have to focus on your studies as much as you can, but you also have to realize that you're a human being. And some days, you know what, you're just gonna need to take a break. It, so you may need to take a break for a week. You may need to take a break for a few months. But the reality is that, which doesn't mean that it's going to dissuade you from your ultimate goal. But I think, and that's one of the things that 
is not necessarily always emphasized in law school is that you've got to you've got to treat yourself well, right? That's why there's a high incidence of alcoholism and drug abuse and mental health issues because I mean part of what your job is as a lawyer is that you deal with everyone else's problems, right? On a daily basis. You you are if not the problem solver, you're the one that that helps people negotiate through those things. And so that starts to wear on you. So you also, while you're dealing with your intellect and saying, okay, this is what I need to do to develop, to get into law school, to graduate, pass the bar, you've got to figure out how are you going to keep yourself healthy, right? And so I think that's part of where the anxiety is coming is like, yeah, you know what, things are not the same, you know, and this is not a political argument, but things are not the same. And I see I see for you all, and not that I don't have my concerns, but I'm in a different place. It's like, you know what, I have some, I have some stability and safety, and I feel blessed for that. And, and that's not being arrogant, but I feel truly blessed for the, the, the gifts that I have. But I do, I do, I see the anxiety and it's it's okay. And because you know, sometimes we pretend to ignore it, like, oh, it doesn't exist, or you're weak. It's not a weakness. It's like, okay, it is what it is. I'm gonna get what I need to get done, but I may need this little time just to. To, to breathe, you know, and, and, and pause. Nice. I'm, I'm sending this to all my friends. As soon as this gets published, this, uh, th this messaging, definitely a wise word. So on, on the note of pause, on the note of just, I'm just going to segue right into materials, right? I, it would be, let's talk about the personal statement. So mm -hmm. again, I'm going to, I'm going to ask a really specific question because this is what keeps happening in the rooms that I'm in. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on, in your personal statement, an applicant looking at, uh, maybe they've looked at their own GPA, they've looked at their own, uh, overall application and they say to themselves and strategically, I think the admissions, uh, the admissions team is going to pinpoint this weakness in me. So I'm going to write my whole per personal statement about it. What are no. your thoughts on <laughs> No, that's my thought. I no, I didn't I mean think to laugh. No, to but, but, but most, most law schools, and again, you need to check with each individual school because they may, in their uh, question prompt, they may say you can address those kind of issues. Um, but generally speaking, well, let me not generalize. Let's just talk about FIU and then you all can, can touch base individually with the law schools. What I want to, here, here's what I say to students, right? Your application tells a story about you, right? So, so your, your application material. So you have your, your undergraduate, your graduate work, um, the LSAT, that tells one part of the story, right? So it's kind of like you're putting a puzzle together. So that tells one piece of it, right? Then you have your resume, letters of recommendations, um, that tells another part, right? So part of what I want to see, and this is what I want to see as a member of the missions committee, I want you to tell me something that I can't get from other places, right? So if I can remember, I think in part of my application, I spent a lot of time doing, I'm, you can, if it's not clear, I'm very close to my mom, right? <laughs> right? And so I spent a lot of time talking about my relationship with her, right? And the values that came for that, right? But not just that, because no one, I mean, honestly, admissions people may not necessarily care that I love my mother so much, right? But saying, okay, what the lessons that I learned that I can take those lessons and apply them in law school, right? So here's my understanding of what law school is. Here's my understanding of the clinical program that you may offer, the externship opportunities, the courses that you may offer, the concentration, right? And make sure that it comes from a place of, of, of sincerity. Don't just say, don't just pick a legal clinic and there's really no connection between anything that you've done, your personal life, professionally and just say, I would love to do that because it's disingenuous and people will know that, right? It's gotta come from a place of sincerity. So to talk about either whatever kind of experiences you had that you think prepare you for law school, what you understand law school to be, but really you wanna try and capture something that doesn't come across in terms of the other application. When it comes to explaining whether you want to explain your LSAT or, or you know, in terms of performance on that or your GPA. And here's the other thing. One of the things that we get in law school is that we get the um, breakdown of your, your GPA. So they do it by semester, semester and put all your grades together for all the schools that you attended. But we also get copies of your transcripts, right? So we can see if you, and law, oftentimes this is what happens, students will start out as weaker and they get better over time, right? Or they may be really good and not be as good towards the end. And then what you wanna do is include an addendum to say, okay, this is what happened academically, right? But I wouldn't do that in a personal statement unless the prompt asks you to do that as a part of the application process. 
incredible. I like what you mentioned about you. I think you, I'm going to assume that you picked your words carefully there. Uh, first of all, read, read the prompts, look at each school individually, always following directions is really important. Uh, but also writing about what you believe or what you understand law school to be. Uh, of looking a little bit into the future. Do you think, is that something, is that if required? You know, it's not required. It's not, it's, I don't think, here, here's what I would say. Well, there, it depends upon where you are in your life, right? So the essay that you're going to write as someone who basically went straight from high school to college, generally speaking, this is broadly, right? So most of your experiences are going to be academic, right? There may be some that you've done professionally, but for the most part, your experiences are going to be based in academics. So it may be a student organization in which you've gotten involved with. There may have been a particular course that spoke to you. There may have been an internship opportunity that you feel like you can leverage in the law school setting. So it's going to be very different. If you are, uh, uh, and we have a number of these students that fall into the category where you've had one profession, right? So we've had a number of people who were in, who were teachers like in, in elementary school and high school who are in law enforcement. And so their stories are going to be very different. And what drew them or draws them to law school is going to be very different. So you have to be in the space that you're in. Having said that, right, the most important thing, but let me, let me take a step back. So <laughs> practically speaking, we know that pretty much a lot of you take the same personal statement and submit it to a bunch of schools, right? You do. Because it's just like, if you apply in a law school, some of them you're going to be like, nah, I'm just going to submit it. The thing that irritates me you better do that find replace. Don't tell me that you really want to go to X law school and you've applied to FIU because what and 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 I know that sounds petty. <laughs> it may be a little bit, right? But but the other piece of it, I mean, looking at it, it's also lawyers are and lawyering is about precision, right? It's about looking at words matter. A comma, a period, um, uh, an exclamation point, a semicolon can cost people millions of dollars, right? So if it's between you and someone else and we're going and the admissions committee is going to look and say, you know what, is this the kind of person who's going to be careful? Is this the kind of person that's going to understand that what you write impacts your client's outcome? That's why you've got to be careful with that, right? So you have to make, you have to make a decision about if you're going to use that one essay, find a place. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so simple too. When you say find replace, I, uh, what do you think? Do you think it's worth it? Maybe say, for example, I think there's a difference here. So of course, if you think if your essay, if you have a dream school, right? Or mm -hmm. let's say FIU, you grew up in that neighborhood and you want to give back specifically to that exact community and you are writing a personal statement about FIU. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the other people who maybe have this other personal state personal statement. And then at the very bottom, uh, I feel like we've all seen it. There's that final line. And that's why FIU would be a great fit for me. Do you think it's worth it? That one line at the bottom of a personal statement of someone who is sending that personal statement out? Or uh, do you think that one line makes a difference? Do you think What's your per, uh, take on it? Or it's okay if you don't want to give an exact. No, I'm uh, going to give you, I'm going to give you, and this is, remember, I'm one member of the admissions committee, right? So personalities, what, what people emphasize and don't. And, and remember, I came to law school as an admissions professional, right? So as an administrator. So my mindset is very different. I won't say very, because that very is a meaningless word, is different than potentially different than say your more traditional faculty member who's tenure track and, and into scholarship and what that means and what law school represents and legal education represents to them, right? I'm a practical person. The reality is that, well, actually your, your personal statement, if you're, on, if you're in that middle group, so students tend to fall into in three different categories. There's the students who based upon their numbers, barring any kind of character and fitness issues, and we can talk about not lying on your application if you want, um, will be admitted, right? Then you have those students who are, just because of their numbers, LSAT, GPA, they're so below, like say that bottom 25, that it's not likely that they're going to get admitted. And then you have everybody who falls in the middle, right? And so if you're falling in the middle and you are, you have identical, like say academic indicia as, as the person next to you, the thing that may make the difference is your personal statement or are your letters of recommendation, right? So it does matter, right? 
So I think when you look at schools, it may not matter as much. So if you're at the median, and, and there have been, I'm sure there have been students at FIU and at other schools and some of the other schools that I worked at as well, where they put in that last line and they have our numbers right there at the median or above, they're going to get in, right? That's not going to keep you out. What the difficulty is that when you when you're getting to, if you end up in that middle group, right? And then admissions committees have to make a decisions that can make that can impact the outcome potentially. Nice. I, I, I really enjoy how you sort of laid it out like that. And uh, hopefully that makes it easier for anyone thinking, no, I, I absolutely need to have that last line in there. Uh, maybe it doesn't come down to that last line. Maybe it comes down to your numbers, everything else going into it, uh, not, not focusing on that as being the piece that's going to get you in or not. Right. There's a lot more to it than just that. Uh, I would love to talk about lying on your law school application and and ter in terms of especially where that lies and you can correct me if i'm wrong on this my understanding is that a lot of the times questions asked in the character and fitness portion mm -hmm. of a law school's application directly reflects or generally reflects that state's bar admission and and what they're trying to do is uh I don't have the good words for us. What they're trying to do is, is mirror what you're going to come across in the bar admission and what you say matters. Uh, can you tell us more about, is that what you're sort of speaking on in terms of not answering character and fitness questions truthfully? Is that gonna come back and bite you in terms of uh, bar passage uh, for that state? How should people go about their law school application? Well, and, and The first thing I would say is that for, you need to check with each local, with each state bar association to see what their applications look like. They usually have them available online. You shouldn't lie anyway. Let's just like, don't lie, right? Let's, let's just put that out there, right? But a lot of times what it is, is that stu students think that they can lawyer, quote unquote, lawyer the process, right? Don't do that, right? You need to, if a question is asked, and you have a question about what you should disclose, you should call the admissions office and talk with them. That's the first thing. Two, it's always better to disclose than not because what the each bar association does this night, if I, I probably, I won't say every bar state, state bar association, but I kind of think probably they do. They will pull your law school application. They ask for a copy of your law school application and they match up the answers that you gave on your law school application with the answers that you gave on your um, application to their state bar, right? They conduct a very thorough criminal, they look at your finances and we can talk about that in terms of your credit rating and what that looks like, right? And so that can be a problem too when you decide to apply for the bar. And so you don't want, to, it's just better to disclose. And what I have seen, this was in my role as Dean of Students, oftentimes it wasn't the issue of what whatever you didn't disclose, it wasn't, that wasn't the thing that kept you out. The thing that kept students out sometimes for a really long time, sometimes for years, is because they didn't disclose on their application. So you've got to, just, if the question is asked and you have a concern about it, I would say just disclose, right? Um, and at a minimum, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, talking to the admissions people or even calling the state bar and see what the expectation is. Because imagine, and all the things that we've talked about tonight, you go through the LSAT, you, you pay for tuition, you pay to study for the bar exam, you pass the bar exam, and then you can't get admitted. It's, it's a lot of time and effort. It's a lot of time and effort. Law school is a lot of time and effort. So making sure you get off on the right foot is uh, paramount. I also, it's interesting what you're saying about call admissions. Call admissions and look at the state bar requirements. I've certainly had pushback from uh, there's a lot of nuance in this. And so not, not sitting down, I think, not sitting down and saying, okay, I got this. If you have anything that's sort of gray area or could be gray area in your mind of, well, do they mean this? Do they mean that? Uh, not trying to go at it alone. There are resources to help you and definitely utilize the resources before you go through three years of really expensive in both time, energy, money, psychological, emotional, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah. but lots of, <laughs> yes. Things, yes. lots of different things going on there using the resources. I think that's all really important. I've heard from uh, people that have maybe like even served in the army or served uh, under 
under certain uh, circumstances that have said, well, if I could serve there, they gave me a green light. Why do I have to disclose this? And these are really hyper-specific and personal issues that call admissions and look at the state bar because another friend, you know, Joe next door can't make that decision for you and don't put it that on them. You know, what's no. going to happen down the road. Uh, so it's, it's really actually refreshing to hear you sort of mention that and, and mention all the resources that are there available to you. I'm checking the chat to see if there's anything else, uh, any, any questions from anybody else in the Zoom room. Before, I actually would love to uh, hear from you in terms of what you're talking about. And it's something, it's an issue that is extremely personal to me. Mm -hmm. I've, I've led a lot of these interviews before and I've, I've said this on YouTube before. So something that's been really personal to me is that I had a career as a professional artist and that meant I was living in big cities and it also meant I didn't have a lot of stable income, right. uh, lots of odds and ends jobs. And when I knew that I wanted to go to law school, a huge barrier for me and also something that's a huge source of misinformation, don't trust Reddit, is what's my credit score looking like? Can I even go to law school? Can I even secure loans? And then once I exit law school, can I even pass the bar? This was I have to say in just 60 seconds or less, because I want to hear from you, Michelle, that if anybody else out there is listening to this and maybe it's a really difficult topic to talk about. Of course. And it's also very scary. This is something that personally made me feel like I was on fire. I was terrified. I was scared. I was being told like, you're never going to be able to go to law school. Uh, is there anything, is there anything that you can shed light on, on what you mean by that in terms of in every state is different, bar, bar passage is different, <laughs> uh, securing loans for school is different. Uh, should someone be getting their credit in check, you know, kind of making sure that that's squared away? Yes. So let's start with the first thing. So there is scholarship, scholarship money, generally merit-based scholarships are based on LSAT and GPA. If you're at a school's median or above, you'll get somewhere from a partial to a full scholarship. So if you can leverage that way, try and get as much scholarship as you can, right? There are some schools that have some limited need-based money. Um, we do, so I think we have up to maybe, I think it changes depending upon our, our budget, but somewhere between $1,500 need-based money. And the great majority of, of law schools pay through loans, right? There are federal loans. So you want to make sure that if you have graduated and and you in repayment that you're repaying those because you can't qualify for additional loans unless you're in good standing with them. Um, there are private loans and there are maxes on what you and that's based upon your credit rating. Um, there's opportunities for you to have a co-signer if you want to do that as well, right? So yeah, it's 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 applying to law school is an expensive proposition. So that's why I say try and leverage as much as, as much as you can for scholarship. Two, pull your credit report before someone else does, right? And so again, we do this and I have done this, right? <laughs> and and, and, and that, that just never, yeah, I've covered my eyes and, and, and that never worked. And so there are free services. There's something called, um, and I'm, I'm obsessive about it now, there's something called Credit Karma. So for free, get it, free, they give you a monthly report, right? And so what you can look at and say, so that's the first thing. So you want to know where your credit score is and you want to keep a track on that on a monthly basis. Maybe not monthly, I'm a little neurotic, but it, it don't hurt because it's just right there. You're on the apps, just do it anyway, right? So you want to do that. When it comes to law, in terms of, of not being good credit, if you, if it's not so much an implication for or being good standing, it's not an implication so much for law school other than loans. If you don't qualify loans or if you get federal loans, that issue may not come up. The bar pulls your credit report. They will pull your credit report and you will not be admitted if they have a concern about your credit. Why do they are concerned about your credit? Because you have trust accounts. You control other people's money. Generally speaking, when you're in debt and you can't keep up with your debt, there may be concern that you're going to access your client's money illegally and that's a problem, right? So that's why they look at the credit report. So one of the things that, and again, you need to check with each state bar association, but one of the things that's important, you have to be, the credit doesn't have to be paid off necessarily, 
but you have to have made an effort. So you have to get in contact with that creditor. You have to be in a repayment plan with them. You have to demonstrate that you're paying that, that, that money back to them. And that has to be, you have to have a record for that. So whether that's six months or a year or whatever. So look at that. So if that's something that's going to be a concern, then you know you have to decide when you want to deal with that. Do you want to deal with that before you go to law school, right? And get that up to speed. Do you want to try and deal with that in law school? I don't recommend taking out student loans to pay off other debt because I, I just don't. But you know, other people may differ because they're like it's lower interest, you have longer time to pay it off. But what I see happens is that you take that money, you pay it off, you keep the private debt, and then you end up with the student loan debt and then the private debt, right? Exactly. And it just bills and bills and bills, and then you are hundreds of thousand dollars in debt. And that's the other thing. Check with each law school because we have to report on our 509 report what kind of debt you are in, like on average for, for students. And so you need to look at that as well. And so, because debt is going to impact if you can buy a house, if you can buy a car, if you decide that you wanna be in a long-term relationship with someone and they don't wanna look at you like, you costing me too much money, I don't wanna be with you. Yeah. <laughs> right? Going out to eat, yeah, going out, going to, out to All those things. So yeah, so it's something that you have to take a look at. Yeah, you know what? I just, I just am so uh, appreciative that you've gone there, you've gone there. And also you mentioning the 509 report, I don't think a lot of people know about that. You know, they definitely know about those ABA reports, those ABA disclosures, sorry, excuse me, and, and about how to research a school. And I, I really do appreciate that you've been able to share so much of your personal knowledge. Uh, I think that an hour like this, an evening together, it's it's almost unparalleled, right? We can't, It's it's, just to be lame. It's kind of like the personal statement where it's like, tell us something that we can't find uh, is definitely how I like to view these evenings. If, if, and, and you and what you've shared with us, I hope shares the spirit, you know, of FIU and about, uh, and what I'm really excited about this, anyone who's listened to this is I hope that it shares the spirit of how important resources are and and reaching out reaching out and not going through it alone you know when i saw what what you've been up to and how much you act as a support for others and how much information you've been willing to share with us this evening i think is that huge missing puzzle piece that i see a lot of people when they're applying for law school and they feel lonely and they're going to the internet to try to figure out and navigate this process I hope that anyone who's listened to this tonight has seen how much you're, you're like, I'm right here. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're right here. Pick up the phone, uh, admissions and anybody, not anybody, but the admissions team is not there as what I can assume that maybe you'd agree with is not like a behind a black wall or a black curtain, mysterious, moody, judgmental thing. You know, everybody is looking for the right fit. And, and they're trying to have the right fit for the applicant. And on that note, what advice do you have uh, for someone who maybe wants to reach out to you, wants to reach out to the school, learn more about FIU and what's going on there? Well, let me, let me just say this. LSAT Unplugged, you guys are doing an amazing job because I did some, some research before I came online to see, okay, who am I talking to tonight? And, and so impressed by what you're offering to our students. So you want to make sure you go through all the resources that are available through LSAT Unplugged. I'm there. And so I have students. And yeah, it is about fit. The reality is that I have spoken to thousands of students in the 20 years that you know I've been in, in law school admissions or over 20 years that I've been in law school admissions. And there are students who come to FIU and there are students who go other places. And, and, and as I said to, to you at the beginning of this, I am here for you, whether you, you could be a multi-generational student and, and your parents could have gone to law school. There's still something that I feel like I can offer to you in terms of perspective and advice, right? You can be a first generation student. And I, and I think in the ideal, that's what the law profession, there, I mean, you sometimes there's a lot of negative stuff that's associated with being a lawyer. The lawyers, but you know what, there's some, there, I would say as a profession, if you pick up the phone, lawyers love to talk, right? So if you pick up the phone and you say to me, I need your advice, right? As long as it's like, there's not a fee associated with it, then, <laughs> then they'll probably give it to you for free, right? And so I want you all to know that if you want to contact me through LSAT Unplugged, if you want to reach out to me directly, you can do that. If you're interested in information about, you know, our FIU Law Path and that program, I'm here for you. That's, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. 
Incredible, absolutely incredible. And it's it's really great to hear that. And if anybody is listening for LSAT Unplugged, I'm gonna plug the fact that, you know, I myself am on a fee waiver for LSAC, LSAC. And if you do have a fee waiver, uh, which you can attain through the LSAC website and look there, you do have a scholarship for LSAT Unplugged's material, something that I didn't even know until I was in front of Steve himself. Uh, and he mentioned that to me. So just like Michelle is saying, looking at all your resources, taking the time for yourself, carving out that space for yourself, your own identity, your own journey, uh, making things work for you, uh, whether it's your studying process, getting to know yourself. Michelle, I feel like we're gonna need a part two to all of this because I really am so interested. Oh, I want to come yeah. back. We didn't even get into what law school is like. Oh, <laughs> I did have questions about that. I did. And, and, and I hope nobody, I didn't forget, you know, when you mentioned that 98%, you know, roughly you threw out that statistic of right. what people are telling you to do and you finding out that that didn't work for you. I just feel like you could really impart a lot of wisdom and that own personalized experience, which that's the real deal. That's what everyone is wanting to hear anyway, you know, right. from from somebody who's really been through it. So I'm sad to, to wrap this up. It, can you drop, uh, can you say your email out loud for anybody? Hey, or it's away so complicated. It's Mason, M-A-S-O-N-M at F-I-U, which is on the screen. Wait, let me point up there, right there, F-I-U dot <laughs> E-D-U. <laughs> yeah, I'm such an old lady. I don't even know where to point. <laughs> so it's just like, that's why you all will say people like me. Thank you, I, I look forward to it. <laughs> You really are making me smile tonight. I can't thank you enough. And uh, maybe I could maybe I could get you a schedule for around you to talk about actual what school is like and what FIU is like too. I Whatever really you all that. need, whatever I can do to help, seriously, in all sincerity. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Awesome. Michelle, thank you so much. Everyone else I unplugged, thank you. And I hope you all have a great journey. Take care, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.